is pouring. Um, I when I left the house, it was sunny and hot, really from Kent. So please don't judge me for my outfit. Um, <laughs> okay, so. I was going to say, how are you guys doing? You're all right. You've been amazing so far. I would say stand up and stretch your legs, but then you might walk away. So I'm going to hold you captive. So, so no two words, when put together, have ever inspired such fear and such loathing. Now, I'm not talking about Donald and Trump. I am talking about Islamic State. Now, those two words... When we put them together, we do not think of anything very positive. We think of words like threat, danger, oppression, binary, polarized, fear, monochrome. All of these things none of us recognize in a thriving, wholesome society. Firstly, let's clarify one thing. There is no Islamic State in the world today. So in the next 10 minutes, we are going to create an Islamic State right here in Greenbelt. But as they say, don't panic, I'm Islamic. It's just what an Islamic State should look like. So to keep things simple, we are, you know when you kind of type into Google like quick and easy recipes, you want to make something really quickly when you come home from work, we're going to approach this in the same way. And we are going to look at how to make a real Islamic State in five easy steps. So first up, every Islamic State needs a well-seasoned, taste the difference, caliph. A caliph, or a caliph in Arabic, is basically an awesome leader who has integrity, respect for all faiths and backgrounds, and has jo justice soaked into every single aspect of their rule. A caliph is popular with the people. I mean, it sounds like I'm describing Justin Trudeau, who, by the way, would get my vote if he did go for caliph. Um, so traditionally, traditionally, a caliph has a public mandate, the support of the people. What Daesh has today is a vote of no confidence from Muslims the entire world over. They are united against Daesh and their so-called self-elected leader. So let me paint a quick example of one of the earliest caliphs of Islam, Caliph Umar. Now, when Umar was, um, he was nearing the end of his own life, he actually um, knew that it was time for someone to take over. And he put together a committee. This was a consultative committee because consultation, or shura in Arabic, is vital. It's a vital Islamic principle. Now, out of these uh, committee members, one of them was the most trustworthy, and his name was Abdurrahman bin Auf. You know you're going to be in safe hands with someone called Abdurrahman. So he was delegated with the task of doing a bit of market research. So he, he collected data from a cross-section of the public. It was a bit like YouGov. He asked the opinions of the men and the women, the businessmen, the students, you name it. And he found that there were a few hot favorites for leadership, but the one that came out just marginally on top was the, the next caliph, who was called Uthman. So he went back to the committee with this research, and Khalif Uthman was elected for his integrity, for his intelligence. I'm literally battling with God. Um, <laughs> not really. Um, and, and his sense of justice. So our first ingredient is added to the state mixing bowl, a leader of integrity with popular support. Our ingredient two is a generous amount of free range, unity, equality, and pluralism. Now, back in the seventh century, the Prophet Muhammad established an agreement. And this was often thought of as the, the, the foundation of the first Islamic state. Now, this agreement was called the Charter of Medina, or the Constitution of Medina. Now, this is six centuries before the Magna Carta, and well over a thousand years before the American Constitution of 1787. The Charter of Medina, it could be called a seventh century model of pluralism. 
it united the tribes that were of different faiths in that city, the Jews and the pagans, and it ensured them full protection, respect for their belief, and gave them all equal rights. In fact, the Charter of Medina called the community one community, or in Arabic, Ummatun Wahida. Umma, you know, traditionally we, we say that this is the Muslim community, but this was a, a word that was associated with one unified community in Medina. And the Charter also recognized that the Jewish tribes had nuances, that they had linguistic and cultural differences. So it didn't treat them as a monolithic block. You've all been submerged into darkness. I can't see you all, but I'm sure that you all have, you are all lights of this community. So our second ingredient, can everyone hear me against the rain? Okay, our second ingredient of equality and unity is added to, let's just put it here, the huge, mixing bowl. So that leads me on to our third ingredient. You know, in Islam, we say that rain is actually blessing. It's a blessing. <laughs> I know we don't feel like that right now, but I think God is pouring down there his blessings on us here in Greenbelt. So the ingredient three is a healthy lug of freedom of religion. Freedom to practice your faith is a beautiful thing. And it's the cornerstone of a real Islamic state. Sharia, or Islamic law, puts an obligation on Muslim leaders to protect places of worship. So let me just tell you a, a story about a real defender of the faiths. Again, one of the, the most amazing men of Islam, Caliph, Caliph Umar. After the conquest of Jerusalem in the seventh century, this was the first time that Jews were allowed back in the city to worship in 500 years. Now, Umar was shown around by the head priest and he was offered to pray in a, in a church. But Khalif Umar, did, he chose not to pray in that church. Now, why would a Muslim leader not pray in a house of God, in a house that the Christians prayed in? Well, there was a reason for it. He said that he feared that if he prayed in this church, that it would be converted into a mosque because his actions would be misinterpreted by the Muslims. So in order to protect the church, he didn't pray in it. And I also want to highlight how this, this freedom of religion, this respect of religion works both ways. Prophet Muhammad did not hesitate to turn to other faith leaders for protection. When the early Muslim community were facing persecution and they were being tortured and reviled in Mecca, where we now go on pilgrimage, when they were tortured in Mecca, the Prophet Muhammad sent 100 men and women to be placed under the protection of an Abyssinian Christian king because he knew that this man was a just ruler. So any idiot saying that Muslims can't trust or take protection from non-Muslims, they just need to look at the example of our prophet. Now, we are nearly done with, with making our Islamic state. Ingredient four is layer on a generous portion of a welfare state. Now, an Islamic state is essentially a welfare state. Islamic civilization saw shining examples of welfare institutions throughout the centuries. I'm gonna just say, mention a few here. There were public soup kitchens that were set up throughout the Ottoman Empire. Now, one of the most famous soup kitchens was actually established by the wife of Sultan I, or uh, uh, of Suleiman the Magnificent. Her name was Roxelana, or Hurum Sultan. It was actually, she was mentioned in a fantastic BBC documentary recently called The Ascent of, Women, of, of Woman, The Ascent of Woman, which is highly, highly recommend. Now this soup kitchen distributed about a thousand loaves of bread and soup daily to the poor and needy. Now also Saladin, Salahuddin, the first Sultan of Egypt and Syria, he was a philanthropist. You know, one of his greatest acts was providing free milk and sugar every week to poor mothers in Damascus. And that was just one of the many things he did. There were also 
bread and water foundations for, for dogs. <laughs> and that was in the 18th century Cairo. There was free housing for the poor. And hundreds of years before the NHS, there was a free healthcare service. And that was offered in public hospitals throughout Muslim lands. So this recipe for an Islamic state is obviously incomplete without our generous portion of a welfare state. And finally, well, not finally, as obviously there can be so many ingredients in this state, but finally for this talk, we're gonna dust it off with a very sweet icing sugar of knowledge. Now, Islam places an absolute must on seeking knowledge and an absolute so much emphasis on learning and education. And this set the foundation for a flourishing of science, arts, and cultures. Now, in 9th century Baghdad, there was, there was a center of learning that was called the House of Wisdom. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. The Beit al-Hikmah, the House of Wisdom. And it's where the greatest intellectual project in human history took place. Has anyone heard of it? It was called the Translation Movement. Now, the, the uh, caliph at the time, Caliph Harun al-Rashid, he had a dream. He dreamt that Aristotle came to him and said, the reason of the Greeks and the revelation of Islam are not opposed. When he woke up, Caliph Harun ordered that all the Greek classics be translated into Arabic. And that actually led to the European Renaissance and it's led to the survival of the classics that we have today. You know, I, I personally studied classical civilization as part of my degree. So in a way, I think I, I've just realized I have to thank Caliph Harun al-Rashid for acting on his dream. So I think the lesson is, you know, follow your dreams because you have no idea what impact they will have on the world. And so in Muslim lands, there was this burst of intellectual endeavor that actually attracted people from all different faiths to come and be a part of that great civilization. You know, in the Quran, it says that the pursuit of knowledge is a divine mandate on both men and women. You know, you often see in the news that, that um, well, you have Boko Haram, which, is, which actually means education is forbidden, which is a complete departure from the Quranic uh, mandate that every single man and woman should seek education. And in fact, in, in Islam, there were thousands upon thousands of female scholars. But this is a lost legacy that we have now that we, we need to revive. In fact, the world, world's oldest existing university was, was established by a woman, a Muslim woman called Fatima al-Firi, and that was in the ninth century in Morocco. So knowledge, learning, progress, human endeavor, they all take pride of place in a real Islamic state. And in conclusion, to garnish our recipe, the bowl is still there, to garnish our recipe, I just end on this, that a true Islamic state places humanity above everything else. It ensures safety and security. It's built on social justice, fairness, equality, coexistence, and progress. It sounds a bit like British values, doesn't it? Um, so basically, this goes to show that it's the universal principles that matter. These are the ones that help us build a really strong society. And as long as we follow those principles through, that's what can make our, so our societies truly great. So I'll end on a quote from the Quran. Had God willed, he would have made you in a single community, but he wanted to test you regarding what has come to you. So compete with each other in doing good. That's very simple. That says to me that the combination of different races, different geniuses, different faiths in the Islamic civilization actually strengthened it and it underpinned the power and the, and the robustness of that. That everyone came together to produce a thriving society. So that's it. That's it for me. It's a very simple, simple quote. And thank you for getting me through the five simple steps to make a real Islamic state.